want us to look at leaders and finance. Then we'll pray. Leaders and finance. That's page 84 in the manual. Leaders and finance. May the Lord bless our finance. May we see money to do this ministry. May our ministry not suffer because of money. In the name of Jesus. I believe leaders need money. And leaders will handle money in ministry. My contention is that most of the teachings and knowledge and information that we have about money is largely what the secular world or motivational preachers, what they taught us. And that has led to a lot and a lot of problems in the church. So I feel that we can't do a good job of leader lift conference if we don't talk about money and look at the finances of ministers of the gospel. The Lord will help us in Jesus' name. I believe talking about money cannot be overemphasized. Cannot be overemphasized. Now, if you have that manual, look at the opening story there in that page 84. Someone sent me a joke. Though I don't find the joke very funny. It's about a man who brought his dog to a priest to be buried and a service conducted for the dog. The priest was angry and he refused. He was saying, how can I bury a dog? I don't bury dog here. We only bury human beings. He later directed the man to a small church down the road because according to him, small church pastor who doesn't have people there we agreed to bury the dog. Then the man who owns the dog replied, I hope the small church pastor will accept one million dollar donation for conducting the funeral for my dog. And when he said that, the angry priest said, he now changed and replied, call me. Why don't you tell me that the dog is a Christian? May we not sell our soul because of money. It's a joke, but it's true. You can see a lot of telltale signs. That goes to show the way the world sees the minister and the way we handle money. So this afternoon, I just want to address our money attitudes. Hello? Or what I call our money personalities. I believe if we can address that, God will help us. There is so much, so much to say about money. So much. But thank God. This is one of my newest book. With Jesus in the school of money. I beg you in the name of God, get a copy. It, this is not written by motivational speakers. It is written by a conservative person, me. And you see, it's broken into four sections. Section one deals with a lot of money attitude and practices that we have as ministers and leaders today. Section two deals with what Jesus said, about 49 things Jesus said about money, about debt, about borrowing, about tithing, about stewardship, about laying our... our our wages, our wealth in heaven, about fair wages, all those things Jesus, treasures in heaven that he said about money, they are there. Then in section three, how do you, how do you become financially free as a minister? Then section four, deals with 2,350 Bible passages that talks about money, wealth, and possession. In other words, all the Bible passages you are looking for about money in the, in the Bible, they are already here. And they are classified 
into wealth, blood money, good money, and all those things. So I think you need a copy. It's not only a readable book, it's a research work. So that if you want your money attitude to be correct, because when I was studying and researching and writing, you know, I came to a conclusion. The only thing that struggles with God in this world is money. Number two, you don't need God to make money. Because Jesus says, you cannot serve God and what? And mama. You will choose one. And when we come to ministry, that is a choice that will always be before us. To choose between God and money. And like I put down in the outline, you know Nebuchadnezzar of old, the Bible says he set up a great idol that he has the whole world to worship. And some people say they are not going to worship. Why majority worshipped? Those two few, about three of them, that did not worship the great idol of gold, he threw them into fire. Thank God, God was already there waiting for them. And he delivered them. But if you look at it prophetically and spiritually, you see the same thing happening today. The devil has set up a great idol of gold in the church. Which big, small, middle-sized preachers are worshipping. May we not worship money. Today we have, we have more of us doing ministry for money than doing it for God. So that's why we need to correct our attitudes because once your attitude to money is wrong, your ministry will be wrong. Take it or leave it. I've seen it happen over and over and over and over and over and over. Once your attitude to money is wrong, your ministry will be wrong. And eventually, even if you are preaching the truth, once you have wrong attitude to money, your money personality is wrong, you will deviate from the right way. In fact, let me be very frank and truthful with you. It was God that saved me. It was God that saved me. And I'll tell you how. When we started church growth, there is no money there. Even up to now, there is no money there. But for those of you who don't know, let me just explain. Now, how can we do a one-week conference, Monday to Friday, asking you to pay 3005 And here you have a 100-page manual. You have teaching. You've, you even ate food. Calculate it. Does it tally? Those two days we did food. Let me tell you, is two hundred and fifty thousand. The BRUT bus is seven hundred thousand. Did you see it on BRUT bus? Eh? And I can calculate and calculate and calculate and tell you that we use about four million to prepare for the conference. Those of us who registered and everything, everything maybe about let me just say rough estimate about one point eight million. Where do we get the rest? A lot of people don't know. But you know, because it's a ministry, we have to do it. But I see pastors complaining, eh, 3,000 is what I will pay you, eh, 3,005 is too high. May God have mercy on your soul. You know when people like that complain, you know my thoughts? It's because they have never done great things in life. If you have done great things in life, you know that 3,500 is nothing. How about, oh, you thought we are using here free. Thank God for Baba Ebenezer Obe and the staffs. But we are paying. Also, we pay for the jail. We pay for everything. Appreciation. Okay, don't let me say pay. We appreciate. We can't come here and leave it the way it is. No. So to run ministry costs money. At a point, I want to run away. I want to go and be doing business growth. Sincerely, that's the truth. If you come to my office, I will show you the file. I want to go and be doing. I told the law. She be the law. I told you. I told the law. I want to go and be doing business growth because business growth. I don't need hundreds of you. I only need fifty people, and each of you will pay forty-five, forty-five thousand. And I'll give you a cup of tea and a printed file. I want Jalang Power Outline. Oh, Tom. 
And I was smiling to the bank. Do you know that Jima Ibrahim, Jima Ibrahim, do you heard about him? And that multi billionaire now, the one who's there in Ireland, he started from a seminar. He organized a seminar for local government on tax. And he did it and took them to Noga Hilton, Abuja, collecting about 45, 45,000 from every one of them. 667 local government chairman and their deputy. He did it for about two times. He gained 36 million. That's what he used to start business. So seminar pays if you are doing it secularly. But when we do it for you people, so that was what I thought. I said, let me go and if I have had my first business growth seminar. And people love it. And I got a connection there to NNPC. I'll be going to NNPC as official consultant and training. It was then the Lord said, don't go there. I have many people there. I don't have many people here. You stay here. That's why I'm still staying here. But when you look at it financially, there's nothing to write to me about it. Is it all the fasting and prayers and the research to write this? You think it's easy? If it is easy, go and write your own. No, it's the truth. We need to tell ourselves the truth. Some people say, uh-uh, what is there? What is there? Uh, along Joe Shin can rely you. No, it's our wrong attitude to money. Sincerely. I need to say it. Because a lot of people will be calling you at 3005. Uh-uh. <laughs> Amen. Now, I'm not castigating you. I'm just explaining for you. By God's grace, I will never leave it. I told you God saved me from it. God has blessed me there. Sincerely. And that uh, is that I told you I went to recently. They gave me the money nobody has given me before. And I will announce something tomorrow. And you know it's a sacrifice. Doing this kind of work is just sacrifice. You just trust the Lord. That the Lord will do it. And he has been faithful. Sincerely, he has been faithful. But the point I'm making is this. It's not the, it's not the uh, motive of money. That kept us here. If it is motive of money, we won't sell those books the way we are selling them at those rock bottom prices. Because I know what other preachers price their books. Because some people tell us, and this one, you people are collecting money. And there are other conferences they are doing that they are not collecting money. Yes, they will ask you to come in free. They won't give you material. They, only a note. You buy tape, you buy all those things. But every day, they will be raising offering. They will even. Ah, not only offering, they will sow seed. They will empty your pocket. So the one they don't collect through registration, they will collect much more through fundraising. And at the end of the day, you are the loser. Because you have nothing to take home. For example, this one now, it has become your own. And you know, like I always say, it's a crime for you to keep it there. It's a crime. Take it home. Take the topic. Modify it. The one in number one, put it for number ten. Number two, put it for number ten. Jimanda da Yime Poloko. Reprepare it and go and do what to preach it. He people say, Ah, yes, sir. This thing you are saying, where did you get it? Tell them you got it from heaven. Abi is it not heaven? Amen. Now the point I'm saying is that we should not do ministry for money. But we should be financially intelligent. Hello? We should be what? Now let's go to our money personality. That's where I want to go. Is in the is in page 85. 85. I've left page 84. I'm going, I'm in page 85. The rest, you will read in this book. Here are leaders' money personalities I've discovered. I want to mention about seven. And I hope you see yourself there. Number one, 
I've discovered that a lot of church leaders we have taker personality. When it comes to money, we just want to take, take, take. A lot of ministers we believe that we are called to collect. We are called to collect from people. That's why when there is time for offering and giving, pastors don't give. And when we give at all, we only give dregs and stipends. Because we have this mentality. And the one that should be receiving from others. Hello? That, mm-hmm, I'm the one that should be receiving and taking from people. How shall I be giving? Can I say this to you? When that is your money personality, you will suffer poverty. Because the amazing thing about money is this. The more you give, the more you will attract. That's the amazing thing. Giving is, you are not benefiting God God by your giving only. You are benefiting yourself much more. The more you give, the more you release, the more you have. Did you hear what the Bible says? Those who water others shall be what too. And he, there is he that scattered and yet increased. There is that holdeth more than his meat, but is tended to poverty. So as a minister, when you have the taker mentality, even your tithe, you won't pay. Your personal tithe, your ministry tithe, you won't pay. And giving, you won't give. When that is your mentality, money will be running away from you. Because money says, when you hold me too tightly, when I wriggle myself free from your hand, I will never come back to you. Number two, providence personality. This is another money personality of ministers. It's in page 45. I mean page 85. It's there. Now, in providence, you are not working. You are not budgeting. But you believe that God will do everything for me. And there are ministers like that. They become executive beggars because they are in the ministry. You are not working. There is no source of income. You are not budgeting. You are not planning your family. You are not doing anything. Those who do, they have been disappointed. Genesis 30, 30. When shall I prepare for my own house? So don't have Providence mentality. God give us the brain to walk. There are school God allow you to go. There are trainings shall pass by. Don't let them waste. In actual fact, it is better for you to get to a level where God bless you so financially and you are doing the work of God free of charge. You are not collecting salary. It is the best place to be. And I'm praying to get to that level. In fact, I've got there already. That's what I'm doing. If you think I'm collecting money from church goods, you must be joking. I don't collect salary. I live by faith. And yet, God is blessing me. At least you can see. Okay, when you read this book, you will see what Jesus says about debt. Don't live in debt. I know if I call those who are debtors now, ah, there are so many. There are so many ministers who are debtors. We even borrow money to buy a car. We borrow money to rent house. We borrow money. Even the clothing on our neck is our, we borrowed it. May the Lord deliver you from debt. The Bible says a borrower is a servant to the lender. Don't have this debt mindset. Eh, she be, I'm doing the work of God. If you borrow, you must pay. Did you remember Second Kings chapter 4? That that woman came to the prophet, my servant, my husband, your servant, died in debt. Even though he died in debt, the debt must still be paid. And the creditors came. And they want to take our, our sons as collateral until the prophet did a miracle. And the debt was paid. May God help you to pay your debt. But you know what? To avoid debt, cut your clothes according to your or cut your size according to your clothes, whichever. Live within your means. Number four, stingy personality. 
having difficulty to give, being tight-fisted and mean, and not even paying personal or ministry time. Yes, I've seen a lot of ministers, they are so stingy. They don't give. Look, when you are the stingy type, you will suffer a lot. There are many benefits that God will take away from you. And when you are among ministers, among friends, and they can identify you as a stingy person, I'm not saying you should be giving to everybody. I'm not saying you should not be wise. But there are areas you must give. Especially when you are a leader. A leader must not be stingy. A leader must be generous. Especially to those who are closest to you. Starting from your family and your co-workers. We should not be stingy. Like those of you who have cars. Most of us are stingy to the driver. I don't know why, but... Like one driver was telling a friend recently, he said, my boss, he said, the boss is a Christian, no, he's a pastor. He said, he's an animal. He said, one day I will kill him. And I will say, ah, has he got to that? He said, say, yes. That recently, they left Lagos and traveled to his own town. He put the driver in their family house where mosquito did justice to his body. But he went and lodged in a hotel. And when they were coming back, the third day, he said, his boss never asked. Did you eat? Where did you sleep? Say no. That even in the bus, they, I mean in the car, they stop and buy Mr. Big or Mrs. Small. <laughs> and he ate everything at the back. He never even asked the driver after three days that did you eat? Driver and so he no come sunny, he was angry. But he not serious. And yet we are leaders. How can you be a leader? You don't care for those who are under you. You travel with them and you never ask. Did they eat? Well, <laughs> one of my pastors told me a story. But the pastor did not forget. You know how people say, Now person we poo poo, now you forget. The person we carry out. No forget. He said he was in the car with his leader. And they were sitting by, side by side. They were traveling. And when they got to a point, they bought this uh, mouth organ. They bought mace. Quite a number. And some coconut and whatever, whatever. And the leader ate everything from beginning to finish. <laughs> he didn't ask his pastor to take, neither the driver. The pastor said he was annoyed. That when they got to where he, he, they were going, the leader saw that his face was he said, what's your problem? Eh, yes, I don't have too many problems. <laughs> I was amazed that even 20 years later, he has not forgotten. And that my pastor usually tell me that the, the most dangerous person to offend in the whole world is a young person. When you offend a small boy, hey! He will live to remember it. He has forgiven, no? He doesn't have grudges, so. But when he sees you, he will remember Mount Ogan. Please don't let us be stingy. Let me tell you a Bible principle. Anybody that works for you must be rewarded by you. Don't let the sweat of your laborer go unrewarded. In fact, don't let their wages sleep over with you. Whatever is commensurate for their work, give it to them. Because you know what? When we talk about causes, your associate can curse you and God will honor the cause if you shit them and you don't pay them when you should pay them. Of course, that's how it didn't work well. Leave it. Leave it. Leave it with God. But pay him his wages. Because the Bible says when your laborer cry to the Lord, a lot of sabot we hear, and it will judge you. So, stinginess, that's what led us to the case of no welfare for our workers. No welfare, nothing. May God help us. Covetous personality, always being dissatisfied with what you have, and you convert others. Avarice personality, being greedy, selfish, stealing, cheating. 
then spend drift. You just spend anyhow. You waste money. Then the final one, this is the only correct one. Generous personality. Which that is giving, sowing, caring, and be open handed to God, the needy, and the kingdom. You know the Bible says, He that giveth to the poor, lendeth unto the Lord. And the Lord will do what to will repay you. That's why I say our fasting today must be supported with our giving. We give seed to missionaries and we give children. You know those clothes? If I tell you where we take them to, there are some pastors, they are in a run down area of Lagos that will stay in Quito. And we give it to widows. I remember there is a pastor who has a ministry to widows. He usually comes. Last week he still came. He said, sir, those school clothes we took the other time, when the widows wear it, one widow bursts into tears because she has this complete with the headgear, with the bangu, and with the shoe. And she bursts into tears and wept and wept and said, for the last 15 years that my husband has died, this is the first time I will wear a complete dress. And they prayed. If you want God to be opening your ways, give. Give. And give to people like me. Because that's what the Bible says. That you should give to the fatherless and the motherless. Yeah, I am fatherless and motherless. You know, I have some people around me. When my father died, my mother died. Their own father is alive. Their own mother is alive. I was telling register, I said, it's not good though. You are shitting me. My mother is dead and your own mother is alive. I won't agree. And last year his mother died. And it's not my fault. In fact, we have to constitute a committee to see to the death of the woman. To run at one hundred and ten. And thank God for Reverend Akisaya. He shook my hand. I said, you? He asked father, he asked mother. And uh, the other week, we sent his father on a very good journey. It, it only pained me that I was not there on the wakeeping day. I could have sent a letter through that man. Yes. I could have sent a letter. That, yes, sir, you are in good hand. My father will welcome you. So you won't be lonely over there. Have a nice journey. <laughs> you know, any money people give to me as fatherless or motherless, once they are spending part of it, they too will join my crew. Okay, your mother will live forever. Your father will live forever. Okay, write money attitudes so that we can go and pray. I'm in page 86 now. Right money attitude for leaders. Now I believe in Job 36.11 that says, If they obey and serve him, they shall spend their days in prosperity and their years in pleasure. I also believe in 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 17 to 19 that says, Charge them that are rich in this world, that they be not high-minded, nor trust in uncertain riches, but in the living God. Who giveth us richly all things to enjoy. You know, I love that passage so much. It's a balanced passage about money for every Christian. Charge them that are rich in this world. It means there were rich Christians in the Corinthian church. So, to be rich, true rightful means, true work, is not a cause. It is part of God's blessing in our life. Charge them that are rich in this world. But we should not be high-minded. Neither should we trust in money. But our trust should be in God. Who giveth us everything. Richly to enjoy. You know God can take you to a level. Whereby he gives everything for you to enjoy. It's not a crime. There's a flyer. Somebody is distributing. Purpose driven network. They are doing a seminar in Nigeria here. He is part of that money. And that's how they do all over the world. Purpose driven church. Is that money? Then he, he returned all the salaries, all the emoluments he has ever collected from his church. He returned it back. 
And he said, from now on until I die, I don't need any dime from this church. And he budgets the money he can spend. You know, it's good for us to live a simple life. Most of us don't learn lesson. If you pile up money in this house and the whole of Nigeria, when you die, are you taking anyone along? Send them a message when you are still here. Because your heaven will be determined by how you spend that money that God gives to you. Charge them that are rich in this world that they be not high-minded, nor trust in uncertain riches, but in the living God who gives us richly all things to enjoy, that they be rich in good works, willing to distribute, ready to communicate. You support gospel work. You print Bible. You support missionaries. You give. The Bible says you are preparing for yourself a time, a great store against the time to come. That they may lay hold of eternal life. What does that mean? Your giving determines your heaven. May you not miss it. How do you develop that? Learn all you could about money and finances. Be, be, be financially intelligent. Know how to handle money, how to spend money. Three, draw near to, unto the Lord because you will find money in God also. Break all money courses over your life. If there are any there, break it. Four, grow out of your wrong attitudes about money. Let God heal you of those negative attitudes. Hold money with a light hand. And you could worry, it's not the language of a Christian. I can die for money. It's not the language of a Christian. You are ready to fight and kill and me for money. It's not the attitude of a genuine Christian. Money, we met it here and we shall leave it here. And we are not taking it yonder. Am I talking to somebody? They have a good work or a calling that God can bless. That's number six. That's number six. Ninety percent of your prayer for money will be answered through your work. Do honest work that bless others. It's not every work that a Christian can do. There are work that a Christian cannot do. The work that destroy others. The work that make others sick. The world that sends others to hell is not a work for Christians. Don't say God bless you and it's my secular job. It's not secular. Find a good work that God can bless. Seven, don't be quick in becoming a full time minister. Did you hear that one? Yes, in Lima. Because you have wife, you have children, you have kids, you have dependents. People are looking up to you, especially those of you who are first born in your family. Don't let your family abuse God because of your calling. And don't abdicate your fatherly, motherly, parentally, and every leaf responsibilities. You have children, you have to take care to school. You have a wife, you need to give money to. You have a husband, you have to be responsible to. You have parents, you need to take care of. Why do you want to become a full-time minister? When your church is 20 members, 30 members, 40 members, 50 members. And you want to be spending only the offering. The law says... Government will jail you. Because the church is a public property. There must be records of income and expenditure. If you think I'm the one that started the church, so I have the right to be eating all the money. Get ready. EFCC is coming. People of today must see that you give. They must see that as everybody is giving offering. You to give. Don't become full time. Of course, you should go and do a work that will not take all your time. But have a source of income. I know a lot of people teach against that. That hey, the God that call you will feed you. Yes, I believe that also. But on one condition, except God say, don't work, don't do anything. Just stay with this work. Except He tells you that. If He doesn't tell you that, work. Oh, am I talking to somebody? Oh, somebody wants to cite an example. Okay, look at Deeper Life today. Deeper Life started more than 10 years before Pastor Kumi became full time. He was teaching in UI, I mean Unilag, and was collecting money and pensions. And so many others like that. But they won't tell you that. They will only tell you today when money has arrived. But they won't tell you the beginning that they two slaves, he sold his car for that ministry. How many people like that? They sold their car. Even some of them sold their building to fund the ministry then. But it's today they will tell you, today we thank God. 
our salary a month only is about 250 million. That's what they will be boasting to us. But they won't tell us when there was no Tata in the eyes of Nyanya. Number eight. Recognize God's financial dealings in your life. How does God deal with you financially? Does he deal with you as he dealt with Adam? Because he supplied all the needs of Adam without asking. Or is he dealing with you the way he dealt with Moses? He asked Moses to go and ask people. And people gave, 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 gave. Until Moses said, it's enough. Or the, is he dealing with you as he dealt with Apostle Paul? He has to work with his hands. And he blessed the work of his hands. He became a tent maker. Recognize how God deals with you. And stay there. Then patiently and strategically build up your finances. Yes. Sometimes God just gives you wisdom. And you are building the finances. That's what has happened to us in church growth. Strategically. 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 A little here, a little there. Yes. That's what God has helped us with. Not that we have somebody there. I'm praying for them to come home. And for those of you that the Spirit is speaking to you, obey the Spirit. He said you should bring that money. Bring it! In Jesus' name. <laughs> sharp, sharp. But so far, we thank God. We've been putting it together. And you know why we are able to survive this kind of conference like I analyzed to you? We, we, we've been doing it for over a long time. So if we have losses here, we can push it to other places. We can hang. We can cut our... We can cut our our excess, our expenditures, we can cut them to size. And by and by, by and by, we can recover from them. That's how we've been doing it. That's the truth. Nothing but the truth. And like the Lord was teaching them in the class, that a church should have record. If you are selling books and tapes, we, should, we have records. In fact, we have auditors. This year alone, we are paid ta tax to government. Was it not about 85000 We pay tax on those books, on those tapes that we, we sell. And we register separately. Because in our ministry... International church growth ministry is different from church growth service. Church growth service is the one in charge of books and tapes and all those materials. So every copy we sell, we pay tax. To be on the same side of the law. I think I'm doing your work for you. I'll collect consultation fee. You are blessed. So sometimes your ministry is like that. Nobody will give you 100 million. Nobody will give you 100,000. Nobody will give you a hand. But God provides some little, little money. It's okay. Start there strategically. Put focus there. What should we buy first? What should we not buy? What should we do first? There are times, today we can advertise in the papers. Before we can't. Today we can do BRT. Before we can't. Today we can print our, our this thing. Three, four years ago, we can't do that. So it's a stage. Gradually, build up your finances. Hello? And don't employ those who cannot pay. Then pray for financial partners. May God bring all of you as my financial partners. Amen. Say better amen. amen. Your income must be more than your expenses. That's a principle. Don't spend more than what you are earning. Then work on your personal ministry. Yes, work on your personal ministry. Don't focus only on church. There are some things you can do by the side. There are seminars you can conduct. There are books you can write. There are materials you can write. You can consult for people. And those ones will be bringing little, 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 little something. They learn your capacity to handle money. And when money is coming, go and learn how to spend money. I, I have what I call 60-20-10 principle. Oh, 60-20-20. Or 70-20-10 principle. It's the principle of spending money. You know, a lot of people know how to make money, but they don't know how to spend money. When your spending habits is not regulated and disciplined, even if you are making billions, you will still come back to poverty. Shall I borrow you? I can borrow you 70, 20, 10. I can borrow you that one. Now, 70, 20, 10 means you don't own anybody. So that means... In every 1,000 Naira you have, the first 10, 100 Naira, that's your tithe. Pay that one. Remove it. Leaving you with how much? 900. The next 200 Naira, remove it. What is that one for? By all means, save and invest. Save and invest. Save and invest. And somebody said Jesus is coming. We don't know when. 
Or do you know the time? The guy who said he will come last year, did he come? He had to recount later. Save and invest. Have savings so and have investment. If you don't save, you are not safe. Save and invest. Because you may say you will die young and death will refuse to kill you. And you live to be 70, 80, 90. What will you be eating? Mama Toro Agbe Kiriabi. Save and invest. Your living expenses should be 700. Transport, clothing, food, rent, what have you. Whatever it covers. If you spend money like that for 5, 10 years, you have money. But most of us, Especially pastors. This is the way we spend money. Oh, the God will bring this hundred thousand. You go bring another one. Psh! Or you just waste it. Stop wasting money. Now how to spend money. The Lord bless you. Be a generous giver. Give to God. Give to men. Give to the work of God. So, because that's another way to get to. And finally, have at least four streams of what? Did you read that one well at all? Have at least what? I want to say that ministers must have at least four streams of income. I can mention them for you if you allow me. Hello? Can I mention them? It doesn't necessarily have to happen today. But this should be your prayer and your planning and your working. Money must come to you from how many sources? At least as a minister. Number one, the salary or the emolument they are giving to you in your church. That's number one. Number two, the honorariums they give to you as a guest speaker. You don't demand for that too. But if you really minister very well, you don't charge for it. God will touch people to give you. It's not scriptural. It's not ethical. For you to go and preach. And you are charging. No. But let God touch them. And give you whatever they want to give you. Am I talking to somebody? You know what I've learned? God is the one that paid the wages of his minister. Nobody can pay. You go somewhere. You look around. You are expecting something good. They give you something poor. And you went somewhere. You look around and say, let's just do the work of God and go away. And they surprise you. That's what I've learned. The rest too are forgotten. Let's stand up. Shaman, come and take. At least you didn't pay for that one. Out of four, I gave you two. I not try. Okay, let me just add one more for you. Okay. You are pleased with one, I'll be two. Uh, you should collect one first. What's the first one? Salary. What's the second one? What's the third one? Rent. You must have rent. And that means you die your property, die your land, die your something. Build it. And collect rent. You know, I said something in the class. I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Just a minute, sir. I said something in the class when we were dealing with money. Some students were shouting. One person told me that he was crying. I said, why? Well, he said he had made a mistake. You know, all these things they teach us. They don't teach us well. Rent. Like me, I collect rent. My first house, I didn't live there. In actual fact, I will give you a, a bomb. If you are living in your house at 40 years, you are financially foolish. If God built a house for you when you are 40, 42, and you park there, you are living there, you are foolish. Financially speaking, you. Why? At 40, you are still young. Why are you going to be doing, stay in your own house? Rent it out. And be collecting rent. And go and live in a rented apartment. You know what we'll discover? When you are living in a small place, and you rent out that big place, the money from your rent can pay your rent here. 
and you have some to save. That who knows? God can open door and you build another one. Before you know it, you are collecting rent here and there. Hey, sin level. And as long as you are living in big houses, big houses, big. Like one preacher, one preacher, our preacher, he came to a conference and said, Praise God, somebody. Hallelujah. God bless me. In actual fact, my new house that I packed to, you will need a map to navigate so that you won't get lost. And people say, hey, that you will need a map. Is that not madness? Okay, let me show it to you. Our fathers can testify to what I want to say. In fact, Dr. Dr. Folari, I said it one day in his presence. He said, ah, yes, sir. Oh, tell him, oh, tell him somebody. You know, when you are 40, 42, 45, you build 10 bedrooms because you have about four or five kids. And you have, so you want all of them to have their room. And everybody is living with you. If you calculate what you are spending, you are eating your food shop. Now, when your kids grow up and they leave home, who will stay in those 10 bedrooms? Because no matter how rich you are, wealthy, you can't sleep in room A eh? in the evening. 12, you go to another room, you sleep two hours. By 4 a.m., you go to another room. By the time you do it in a week, your people will carry you to Arrow. They will only stay in one room. And you know what is happening? Those, those are our leaders, our fathers that have gone ahead, that made mistake of building five, six, seven bedrooms. They are selling it to. Because when you get to 65, 70, to be climbing stairs, it's a problem. Now downstairs you go live. Oh.